This episode is from series two of Modern-ish Poets with Mark Ford and Seamus Perry. To listen to their first series and all other close reading series from the London Review of Books, sign up to our close reading subscription. Go to lrb.me forward slash close readings or click on the link in the description. Welcome to Close Readings, the latest in a series of LRB podcasts about modern poets who wrote in English, drawing on the rich back archive of reviews and essays and other pieces published in the pages of the London Review of Books. My name is Seamus Perry and I teach English literature at Balliol College in Oxford. And I'm talking to Mark Ford, poet, critic and professor of English at University College London. And our subject today is the poet Louis McNeese. Uh, one of the contributions to the London Review of Books about McNeese is by Marilyn Butler, and she says in that piece that in one way or another, McNeese was always autobiographical. Do you think that's true, Mark? I think his best poems all reveal that the pressures of his autobiography in terms of the effect on him of his fairly disastrous early childhood is something which features in poem after poem of the ones which we still read today. McNeese wrote enormous amounts, given the fact he died in his mid-50s. His collected poems is some 600 pages, and there was all the radio plays, enormous amounts of criticism as well. He was a reviewer. He really lived the, the kind of literary life. But in his kind of most powerful moments, he does seem to always be returning to the bleakness of his childhood and the kind of divisions which it inculcated in him. I think McNeese is one of those poets who is often sort of figured in as divided, obviously, between uh, England and Ireland is the most kind of obvious sort of geopolitical division. And, and there rages in the LRB pages uh, when the people discuss McNeese, to what extent he was English and to what extent he was Irish. And um, Irish poets tend to claim him very much as the precursor for Northern Irish poetry that sort of developed in the 1970s. Poets like Seamus Heaney, Derek Mahan, Michael Longley, Paul Muldoon, Tom Paulin all sort of reverence McNeese as the kind of the great Irish poet after Yeats, whereas English contributors tend to see him as going back to Ireland for rugby matches now and again, but as basically a product of Sherburn, where he went to school, Marlborough, where he went to school, Oxford and the BBC, where he worked most of his life. So there is an interesting division there. But those divisions go back to really primary psychic divisions that sort of tore him apart, you could say, in his first seven years. And these are, uh, we should say, divisions of which he was entirely and even acutely self-aware. We're not doing any kind of ingenious piece of psychoanalysis by spotting these divisions. They are very often his main subject matter. Yes, I mean, to fill in readers who aren't familiar with the, with the biography, he was uh, born in 1907 in Belfast, Protestant. His father was, was rector of a place called Carrickfergus, where he moved soon after he was born, about 10 miles outside Belfast. And his mother, who seems to have been, or he describes her in, in his biography, autobiography, The Strings of Falses, very lively and, ex, ex, uh, and imaginative and exciting person, suffered terrible health problems and a full breakdown when, she, when he was five. And she went to an asylum. It was in, in uh, Dublin, I think it was. In Dublin, that's right. Some sort of nursing home. Yeah. And she died not long after and it left him with a, 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 he would bequeath then a series of fairly ferocious nannies who put the fear of God into him. One of them was extremely kind of um, religious minded, uh, as of course was his father. And it's probably worth mentioning that he had an older brother uh, who had Down syndrome and, and that he mentions in a letter to his friend John Hilton, also cast a tremendous pall over his childhood. And, well, there's this extraordinary poem, Autobiography, which was actually written in 1941. But we may as well start with that, since that seems to encapsulate in, you know, haunting terms, the most haunting of terms, the legacy of this childhood. Yes, it's um, a very beautiful intermingling, isn't it, of fond memories of childhood, fond memories of the garden, of the rectory. And McNeese will return in lots of poems to the enclosed, sort of precious, threatened, but delightful space of, of the garden. That played against um, what he calls the black dreams. Uh, and we know from the memoirs, don't we, that he, he genuinely did have the most terrible, haunting nightmares that seem 
wrapped up not only in his own childish feelings of guilt about his mother's ill health, which he and indeed she blamed on the difficulties of his birth, but also the the severities of the kind of religion to which he was exposed, not only in his father's church, but also, as you say, at the hands of the f- fearsome Miss McCready, who is uh, looking after him most of the time. Yes, and I think it, you mentioned the garden. It's, it's interesting the ways in which this poem, which we'll, I'll, I'll read in a minute, kind of connects with the sort of nonsense poetry of um, the mid-Victorian era. Um, and he was a great fan of Edward Lear. There's a letter which um, Nick Laird quotes in his piece in the LRB talking about cats. And a couple of the cats' names derive from Edward Lear. So he was clearly an Edward Lear fan. But there is a kind of Lewis Carroll-like, sort of dreamlike quality to much of um, Magnesia's best poetry, a kind of delirium almost, which uh, connects with the nonsense verse traditions of the mid-19th century as uh, or mid to late 19th century as developed by Lear and Carroll. Uh, anyway, here is autobiography. And also, I should just say before, it, it makes use, like Yeats often does, of a refrain. I think he probably got from Yeats this use of an italicised refrain, which sort of nails the poem and is, is a, a kind of return. And that's very much what happens in poem after poem in McNeese, that he seems to be getting away from something, but he ends up returning to it as if acting out some kind of compulsive, psychic configuration. Autobiography. In my childhood, trees were green and there was plenty to be seen. Come back early or never come. My father made the walls resound. He wore his collar the wrong way round. Come back early or never come. My mother wore a yellow dress, gently, gently, gentleness, come back early or never come. When I was five, the black dreams came, nothing after was quite the same, come back early or never come. The dark was talking to the dead, the lamp was dark beside my bed, come back early or never come. When I woke, they did not care, nobody, nobody was there, come back early or never come. When my silent terror cried, nobody, nobody replied, come back early or never come. I got up, the chilly sun saw me walk away alone, come back early or never come. The poem beautifully uh, exemplifies what Ian Hamilton says about McNeese in his piece, that he has a a disposition to self-scrutiny or what Hamilton calls a kind of authoritative fretfulness. And there is that mixture, isn't there, of, of um, the exploration of some something which is deeply damaged and, and neurotic, but at the same time, a poetic voice which is sort of completely in control. It is in control, but it, it's, I mean, the sil- silent terror. I mean, it, it looks forward to confessional poems. This is a kind of pre-Sylvia Plath style poem in terms of the dramatisation of, in an expressionist way, of the most extreme states. And like something like Daddy, it does use the the, the nursery rhyme refrain as a way of plumbing and, and um, enacting uh, these very, very primary terrors. Didn't he use as a pseudonym? I was thinking of the last, last line, saw me walk away alone. One of his pseudonyms was Louis Malone, <laughs> Louis M. Alone. Uh, and I think that loneliness is what, is a characteristic of much of his most... Uh, of his persona, that however much he participated in 30s get-togethers and was convivial uh, at the pub (laughs) in the BBC years, there was a kind of aloneness about McNeese which drives his poetry and that sense of solitariness, of, of never being able to connect, of having been abandoned in some fundamental way when he was a child and feeling partly responsible for it but also, the, obviously, the victim of it uh, is what creates the, the sort of twisting, turning, supremely sophisticated and clever and intelligent idiom, but one which really, in poems like this or the late poems collected in The Burning Perch, seems to be probing very, very dark, bleak, inhospitable places in the psyche. Let's follow him um, through the next few years. So, as he says in his early poem called Carrick Fergus, I went to school in Dorset, the world of parents contracted into a puppet world of sons, far from the mill girls, the smell of porter, the salt mines, and the soldiers with their guns. 
And that last re reference is to the growing disquiet in um, Irish politics, which he witnesses before heading off to Sherbourne School um, in 1917. So it's very unlike the other poets that were often associated with McNeese in the minds of literary journalists in the 1930s, whose backgrounds were extraordinarily middle class, peaceful, unpoliticised. In Auden claimed he'd never even opened a newspaper until he'd left Oxford. McNeese already as a boy has seen soldiers on the streets. So he goes off to, to Sherburn and then, as you say, he wins a scholarship to Marlborough, which is a pretty sadistic and brutal school at the time. He makes best friends with Anthony Blunt, who's, of course, later most famous for becoming a Soviet spy. And he's reading all the sorts of things that an ambitious young intellectual would be reading in the mid-twenties. He's reading the Sitwells and Aldous Huxley and Eliot, and he's disliking Tennyson and all that kind of stuff. And then he goes up in 1926 on a scholarship to Merton College in Oxford. And in Oxford, he doesn't fit in any more than he fits in anywhere else, does he? He's got a nice account in his memoirs of experiencing Oxford as, as a place where you were either uh, almost exclusively male, needless to say, you were either gay and an aesthete, or you were straight, and all you wanted to do was play rugby. And McNeese finds himself in neither of these categories. He's straight and he's an aesthete, so he doesn't fit in. So it's the story of his life, really. And he likes rugby, <laughs> and he likes sport, and often, quite often uses sporting metaphors, understanding them um, and experiencing them. Yes, uh, and he was obviously a brilliant scholar. He got a, a good first. And, and he studied classics. And I think the importance of classics, uh, his classical education to his poetry, is um, an interesting one. He, he did a lot of translations from, or from Latin, but um, the ways in which his syntax works often seems to have the, the complexity of the Latinate but combined with a, a, a diction which is insistently up to date, um, as Auden insisted the, the 30s poet poetic diction should be up to date. So I think something of the dialectic that you get in a poet like Eliot between the past and the, and the present is operating in uh, McNeese, not in a showy way through allusions, but through the complexity of his verbal formulations, which do seem to me to somehow have been shaped by this very rigorous classical education. And when he went to Birmingham, it was as a lecturer in Latin and Greek, and he taught that for a lot of the 30s. He taught at Birmingham and then in London. But he was brilliant at catching the flavour of, of urban life. And Birmingham is different from London. There's a poem called Birmingham, which just has a kind of documentary quality. And I think that that, we sort of talked about the dark places that McNeese's poetry goes to. But like many 30s poets, there's also a journalistic or that should rather be sort of documentary aspect to his poems. And the opening lines of Birmingham give you that sort of description of the modern city with no particular bias around it. He's not lamenting the mod modernity in the way that Eliot does. There's a kind of a oblique sense that capitalism is delusory, <laughs> that people buy into capitalism and then end, up, then end up disappointed. But mainly you just note the observing eye and the extent to which he's fascinated by his ability to describe the way a modern city like Birmingham looks in the 30s. Smoke from the train gulf hid by hoardings, blunders upward. The brakes of cars pipe as the policeman, pivoting round, raises his flat hand, bars with his figure of a monolith pharaoh, the queue of fidgety machines, chromium dogs on the bonnet, faces behind the triplex screens. Um, those chromium dogs would be jaguars, wouldn't it? They, they, is, is a, no, well, I forget which car has a chromium dog on its bonnet. But that's an example of the, the really microcosmic attention to detail that you get in McNeese, that he really gives you the, the particulars of a scene uh, and, and get, really builds it up so that it, it could almost be kind of filmed uh, in the original. Yeah, that, I, I think um, Edna Longley, who's one of his very best critics in, in her book about uh, McNeese um, makes a comparison between this kind of urban poetry and Larkin. And do you think there is a kind of a kinship in a way between McNeese's Birmingham and, and Larkin's Hull, which which is also, you know, lovingly described at the same time, sort of held at a bit of an arm's length? Definitely. And Larkin was a, was, um, a great admirer of the early McNeese. Uh, he reviewed a few of the later volumes, not particularly admiringly, but he wrote a terrific obituary and he talks about 
McNeese as being the poet who, whose poetry presented everyday life. He was one, a poet who presented everyday life. Uh, shop windows, traffic policemen, ice cream soda, lawn mowers, and an uneasy awareness of what the newsboys were shouting, um, that as a 30s poet, there's always in McNeese some sense of impending disaster, waiting for the end boys, as Empson put it in his poem, Smack at Auden, that sense of some doom. But Larkin goes on to talk about McNeese displaying a sophisticated sentimentality about falling leaves and lipsticked cigarette stubs, which that you do get lipstick cigarette stubs in, in Autumn Journal quite often. And I think that really nails the, the appeal of, of McNeese's poems, that while they have a, a kind of hard-edged, uh, journalistic, politically aware uh, quality to them, underlying it is a kind of enacting of a kind of sentimentality that it's OK to feel about these things. Um, and that's the kind of balance you get in Larkin between the kind of caustic observer and the, obser and the romantic poet who's suddenly overwhelmed by feeling, contemplating the everyday. And so I, you can see how that line goes through Larkin, through to Larkin from, from McNeese's poetry, particularly that of the 30s. And uh, mixed up with that, as we've already said, this uh, sort of background sense of, of historical doom, of, of an inevitable progress towards some kind of political catastrophe, which he can sometimes touch in in a very light and, and subtle way, can't he? So in that poem, Birmingham, for example, he has a lovely Larkin-like description of, a, of, of the sky, into the sky, plum after sunset, merging to duck's egg, barred with mauve zeppelin clouds. And just slipping in the mention of zeppelin is a very you know, witty way of insinuating trouble on the horizon, isn't it? I think um, he, he does, like Auden, give you these politicised landscapes, these landscapes which are pregnant with disaster or a history which is perhaps not explicable, but which is full of some kind of failure or disaster. But I think he's different in that from his Irish background, he, he was aware of them to a much greater extent. And, and a number of his greatest poems are depictions of Irish landscapes. And they're not Irish landscapes which are idyllic, or there is an idyllic element to them in that he sometimes figures the west of Ireland, Connemara, the west coast of Ireland as, as a kind of pastoral. And his, his uh, father traced his ancestors to, to that. So he does see, to see the west of Ireland as... Uh, in some utopian terms occasionally, but he's also very aware in poems like Valediction, which is from the same period as Birmingham, of the extent to which uh, Ireland was riven by sectarian murder, even back, back then. This is from Valediction. Died by gunshot under borrowed pennons, sniped from the wet gorse and taken by the limp fins and slung like a dead seal in a bog hole, beaten up by peasants with long lips and the whiskey drinker's cough. And it's great the way he kind of moves from the cataclysmic to the precise again, that whiskey drinker's cough. Park your car in the city of Dublin, see Sackville Street, without the sound sandbags in the old photos, meet the statues of the patriots. History never dies, at any rate in Ireland. Arson and murder are legacies, like old rings, hollow-eyed, and so on. So that... He's not only responding to, to the doom that was about to engulf Europe, he's also inflected all the time with the cataclysmic uh, history of Ireland. That's, I think, what allows him to maintain this resolute scepticism about all solutions to political events. Whereas Auden flirted with far-left politics and there were many who believed that communism would sweep Britain and, and we'd all live a, in a communist utopia. But Nice was never caught up in those kinds of political beliefs. Yes, we should say something about that, shouldn't we? Because it does make his position within um, what literary journalists were soon calling the Auden group or the Auden generation. It does, it does make his position within that group uh, an unusual one. Uh, because for McNeese, it isn't really a, a, a matter of deciding which ideology you wish to support. You know, which side are you on in Spain? Well, he was on the side of the Republic, but not in a kind of a, a, a militant card-carrying way. It's it's more 
a, a distrust of ideology at, at all. Um, uh, one of the themes that runs through his poetry from beginning to end, really, is a, is a, a mistrust of all big ideas as things that are going to distort the reality of your experience and take you away from the concrete and the lived and remove you to a realm of the ab abstract and the theoretical. And he sees these things as, as the greatest threats to human decency, doesn't he? Yes, in a way, it's a sort of liberal humanist position if you had to kind of characterise it. But I, I think going back to the 30s, you've got to keep in mind the context in which people were being drawn either to far right or far left solutions. So there, there was a kind of courage in McNeese's refusal to write lines like um, um, Cecil Day-Lewis, look out bimbo, we're learning to shoot, <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, which caused much, causes much hilarity now, the idea of these poets shooting. Of course, some did shoot, um, went to Spain and were killed. And McNeese did lose friends in, in the Second World War, a number of friends for whom he wrote elegies. But I think you're really right in stressing the power of his poetry to connect to the concrete and to the actual, and that that is something that he's grasping onto as a way of not only sort of dealing with political dilemmas, but also escaping the black dreams, uh, which are kind of haunting him. His most famous um, poem, which kind of celebrates exactly this aspect of, of life is Snow of 1935, um, is probably his best known poem. And it's one which can be read as a, a if it's a manifesto poem, it's a manifesto of commitment to the contingent and to the textures of the contingent and also to stressing their incomprehensibility and their our inability to control them. So, um, again, there's a sense of McNeese to some extent as the victim of what's happening around him, that as an agent, he's never particularly able to pre present himself as someone who can find solutions much more. He's, he's good at registering the ways in which we experience uh, and also at tapping into the incomprehensibility of that experience. How do you interpret snow anyway? What's your line on it? Well, I think very much as you've just said, I thought, I thought you put it beautifully. Uh, and there's something saving about, about it being incomprehensible, isn't there? Uh, it, it's an odd kind of secular mysticism of the ordinary or, or something that he's on. I mean, the, the lines that we, we ought to read, I suppose, are world is crazier and more of it than we think, incorrigibly plural. I peel and portion a tangerine and spit the pips and feel the drunkenness of things being various. Now, there are little hints and tips in various bits of, of McNeese that he liked Whitman a lot or admired Whitman. Uh, and you can see a kind of Whitmanian kind of delight, can't you, in variousness as, as, a, 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 as an existential good in itself here. But quite unlike Whitman, in the sense that this delight in, in variousness, this delight in the incorrigible plurality of things, is, is sort of hedged around with a pervasive melancholy that this particular kind of diversitarian worldview is sort of doomed because, you know, politics and history and ideology and various sorts of forces are going to come along and, 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 and crush it. So it's like a sort of melancholy Whitman, which is to say not very much like Whitman. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And the way in which um, in the next stanza, the final stanza, and the fire flames with a bubbling sound, the world is more spiteful and gay than one supposes. Uh, the spitefulness that uh, he was pretty disillusioned, <laughs> uh, as all the 30s poets were. And it was a question for McNeese of ways of registering that resistance to belief systems that promised uh, salvation. And uh, the final two lines capture beautifully what you've been talking about in terms of his commitment to the concrete and the senses on the tongue, on the eyes, on the ears, in the palms of one's hands. There is more than glass between the snow and the huge roses. So the poems we've been talking about so far all come from his volume, which is simply entitled Poems, which was published in 1935. By this stage, he's been teaching classics in Birmingham for, for five years. He's uh, met Auden and has um, formed a friendship with him, which didn't really exist when they were at Oxford together. It's not his first book, is it? In 1929, he published a book called Blind Fireworks, which is 
full of the influence of Sitwell and so on. But 1935, I suppose, most people would think was a great advance on blind fireworks. And it was published by Faber, by T.S. Eliot at Faber and Faber. So this, this was McNeese's debut in the you know, serious grown-up poetry world. He, he, he joined the stable, um, which, I mean, Eliot had an extraordinarily good eye for the young poet. Um, even poets who had diff- different political belief systems to, to his. And um, it's interesting that uh, I think one of the, the LRB pieces refers to Eliot slightly complaining about McNeese supporting a Labour candidate in Oxford because uh, Eliot was himself by no means in favour of favour of a Labour government. But um, McNeese admired Eliot in, enormously. And I think his poetry is powerful. One index of its power is the way it, it has absorbed the lessons of Eliot with ever, without ever sounding like Eliot. Hmm. And of Yeats as well. Um, so, uh, and he wrote a book on Yeats published in 1939, and Yeats he admired e- enormously. Hmm. But he did pilot away towards an idiom that shows his reading of those poets. But it, it never sound he never sounds in their debt uh, in any particular way. And what he particularly, I think, excelled in both in these early poems and then again in his late poems was these weird parables which one can't quite make sense of but which somehow capture intensity without being specific about what it is that's troubling him. One I like particularly is, again, a short poem from the 1935 volume poems, Wolves, which has all the sort of fear and threat of mid-30s, the mid-30s zeitgeist, without offering any solutions to it. Wolves, I do not want to be reflective anymore envying and despising unreflective things, finding pathos in dogs and undeveloped handwriting and young girls doing their hair and all the castles of sand flushed by the children's bedtime level with the shore. The tide comes in and goes out again. I do not want to be always stressing either its flux or its permanence. I do not want to be a tragic or philosophic chorus, but to keep my eye only on the nearer future. And after that, let the sea flow over us. Um, That again is a kind of credo, idea of keeping your eye on the nearer future and renouncing uh, any kind of claim to understanding or control of events beyond that. He's got a nice line in in, uh, an essay he writes in the mid-30s called Modern Poetry, hasn't he, where he says the the poet's first business is mentioning things. And I think that poetic of mentioning things is absolutely what you can see in those great poems and in some of the poems that we'll come on to from the later 30s too. In the meantime, we should catch up with his life. His first marriage has broken up disastrously, very quickly, leaving him with a young boy to look after. You mentioned the presence of Eliot in his life and one of the things that Eliot does for him is to commission a book of, from McNeese and Auden all about Iceland. Now, this book is described by McNeese himself as a hodgepodge, and it's very difficult to characterise the volume Letters from Iceland to someone who hasn't actually seen it. I mean, how would you you seek to describe this odd book? Well, it's got Letters to Lord Byron. The Auden's a hilariously long poem. And McNeese was... They they weren't great camping companions, were they? McNeese sort of (laughs) uh, wasn't very well prepared for this particular trip. But it didn't take a tent. That was the problem. (laughs) Yes. So he had to share Auden's. And Auden didn't like that. But it it initiated what was actually um, a a strand of McNeese's writing, which is really prominent in in terms of his oeuvre overall. That is his travel writing, that he was, uh, like Auden, a... A, a travel poet, and he wrote a lot of poetry out of his travels. And there was this vogue for travel books, which included poetry in the 30s. And he wrote an, another one about the a trip to the Hebrides. Was it the, the Western Isles in Scotland, which was called I Crossed the Minch? Minch. Minch, yes, which he did with um, a woman he was involved with at the time, Nancy Coldstream, whom he was in love with. And some of these books were kind of potboilers or ways of kind of, you know, keeping, getting some money into the coffers. But they did occasionally inspire really fantastic individual poems. Probably the most famous is Bagpipe Music, probably the first McNeese poem that I ever came across when I was at school. And it, it's to be read in a Scottish accent, which I don't think we're going to attempt. I don't think But so. it's a brilliant sort of summation of 30s doom combined with a sort of ro- rollicking 
verse form, which kind of keeps it ticking along like a like a metronome. Give us a verse or two. It's no go the merry-go-round. It's no go the rickshaw. All we want is a limousine and a ticket for the peep show. Their knickers are made of crepe de chine. Their shoes are made of python. Their halls are lined with tiger rugs and their walls with the heads of bison. John MacDonald found a corpse, put it under the sofa, waited till it came to life and hit it with a poker, sold its eyes for souvenirs, sold its blood for whiskey, kept its bones for dumbbells to use when he was 50. It's no go the yogi man, it's no go Blavatsky. All we want is a bank balance and a bit of skirt and a taxi. Oh, I've slipped into scotch there. Uh, I knew you'd slip. <laughs> yes, why is that so good? I mean, uh, the use of the off rhymes is, 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 you know, brilliantly inventive and funny. And he said himself somewhere that, that it was meant to suggest the wheeziness of Scottish bagpipes, these, these kind of off rhymes. But it's a great kind of raucous poem of, of rejection, isn't it? It's, it's another kind of valediction poem, like the valediction poem to Dublin. But here he's... But what is he saying goodbye to? He seems to be saying goodbye to a complete kind of phantasmagoric kaleidoscope of different aspects of of Western life. Is that right? I suppose he's being sceptical about the sort of idyll of a rural, a rural escape from modernity, that, that, there, that, that modernity and capitalism have invaded everywhere, so there, there's no point in harking back to some nostalgic past. But it segues towards the end into one of the most kind of um, evocative of um, pre-war threats. It's no go, my honey love. It's no go, my poppet. Work your hands from day to day. The winds will blow the profit. The glass is falling hour by hour. The glass will fall forever. But if you break the bloody glass, you won't hold up the weather. Which is surely as good as any of kind of Auden's waiting for the war poems. So that quality of a kind of a, a panoramic observation that you get in, in bagpipe music, so things seen from all over this land that he is he is rejecting, that impulse um, then goes on to to stir in his his next major work, doesn't it? In in a, in a much much bigger way. The next work is Autumn Journal, nineteen thirty nine. I mean, the next major work, nineteen thirty nine, which is a is a sort of a portrait of of England of McNeese, of Europe, in the last few months of 1938. And he described it himself as both a panorama and a confession of faith. So the aspects of, of a poem like Bagpipe Music, which, which is a sort of a catalogue poem, are then uh, kind of reimagined in Autumn Journal, which uh, brilliantly weaves together his personal situation, thoughts of his marriage went wrong, thoughts of his current romantic entanglements, but also thoughts about what's happening in Spain. There are two visits to Spain um, recounted in the poem, what Chamberlain is doing in Munich, um, the famous Oxford by-election that, that you referred to earlier on, um, where T.S. Eliot supported the other candidate. What are we to make of, of Autumn Journal? It is a, it is a, a great, as, as he says, panoramic list poem. It, it has uh, lasted really well. I think that's one of the surprising things, that it's full of the contingent and the, the it captures the zeitgeist with a, a, a fullness and attention to detail, which is unrivaled in, in the 30s poems. But it, it may, may, might have just seemed like a, uh, like a, diary, a series of diary entries. But it sort of re-emerged in the... For, for, for poets of the 70s and 80s is somewhat, somehow a, you know, a, a really important template uh, as a way of writing poetry that could be political without being propagandistic and without um, excluding the personal. I think Ian Hamilton in one of his pieces calls it intensely self-absorbed. I'm not quite sure I agree with that in that the self that McNeese is exploring in the poem is much more sort of every, not not an everyday person it's McNeese obviously he's, he's he's writing a journal or a diary but he's not presenting himself as having particular uh, being particularly brilliant or sophisticated he's to, to an extent the the kind of an everyman figure or uh, he's not that different from a, an average person and I think again his scene painting his his kind of journalistic ability to recapture places textures details and to make them resonant is, is helped by the rhyme scheme which is um, in some ways um, I mean it's kept up th throughout it's not obtrusive but it keeps the poem 
kind of connected and rolling on. And there is a kind of sprawl to it, but it's it's um, it's in a, a kind of welcoming sprawl. I, I, I haven't thought of him in relation to Whitman, but now you, you mention that, there there is that sense of writing a poem in which anything can find its place, which you get in Song of Myself. And that includes all aspects of McNeese's own life. He recalls in, say, section six, his trip to Spain with Anthony Blunt, and it's a brilliant, brilliant again poem about a, a, a place on the on the eve of destruction. And I remember Spain at Easter, ripe as an egg for revolt and ruin. Though for a tripper the rain was worse than the surly or the worried or the haunted faces with writings on the walls, hammer and sickle, buaco, viva, muera, uh, and so on. And you get this really. Um, detailed account of his trip to Spain and all the different kind of, you know, tribulations of the of the tripper. They loved yes. the notion of the tripper, didn't they? <laughs> yes, yes. What, what, what are the kind of resonances of that particular word for McNeese and Alden, the tripper? Well, I think I think it's something that's sort of a little bit, little bit less sort of end-directed than the quest, isn't it? You sort of go out and, and you wander about and things happen to you. And I think that's that's absolutely at the heart of the way that McNeese often thinks about himself as, as someone to whom things happen rather than, as you were saying earlier on today, someone someone who is full of a kind of self-directing agency of his of his own. They're quite derogatory about the tripper, though. I mean, the, the tripper is, <laughs> is a sign of modernity not to be admired particularly. But he's very honest. And he one of the things that he prides himself on and dramatises in this poem and many others is his honesty. And, and that was obviously a, yes. a kind of crucial virtue for 30s poems. Um, and the honesty involved all sorts of things, uh, as in bagpipe music, honesty about the end of empire. I think um, McNeese and Auden can be categorised, if, if you want, if you like doing these kinds of things, as the first two major poets of the post-imperial Britain, mm. or the archipelago, uh, if you include, want to use that term, that, that empire is, is over and they are trying to find ways of living within the kind of the remnants of empire, the kind of tiger skins that you find uh, in in bagpipe music and so on. And Autumn Journals starts with a, a kind of rather withering look at the old colonel uh, who's retired in Hampshire, uh, the spinster sitting in a deck chair picking up stitches and so on. So a rather withering take on these relics of empire who have retired to Hampshire. John Kerrigan in his LRB piece talks nicely about the way that McNeese's poetry revolves around what, what Kerrigan calls an, eth an ethic of honesty, to, to pick up on, on that word that you used. And the honesty kind of communicates itself in Autumn Journal, doesn't it really, um, partly through the, the way that the poetry is so open to contingencies. It seems so, um, of course, it is entirely directed by McNeese, but the feel of the poem is, is that it's open to sheer circumstance, uh, to, you know, to what happens to happen. Um, and the way that so much of the poem is strung along strings of the word and, as though it's simply about the consecutiveness of of what chanced to occur, like when he loses his dog, is that is that? Yes, yeah, so I was, going to, I was going to read the dog bit. <laughs> it always stuck 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 in my mind. And I found my dog had vanished, and thought, this is the end of the old regime, but found the police had got her at St John's Wood Station, and fetched her in the rain, and went for a cup of coffee to an all-night shelter, and heard a taxi driver say, it turns me up when I see these soldiers in lorries. And, you know, the amount of emotional, and indeed for that matter, the amount of sort of political ground <laughs> that is covered in those six or eight lines is, is extraordinary. It's gone from a shaggy dog story through to, you know, premonitions of war. <laughs> yes, and, and um, I suppose if you are alive in, were alive in 1938, living in London, you would see all around you signs of war. And um, uh, there's a bit when he talks about listening to the news and he, on the one hand you're hearing, you're worried about the cricket scores, but the next thing you're hearing about is Hitler on the radio. And so that the, these juxtapositions of the everyday and the global catastrophe that's threatening. And in the same one, number seven in Autumn Journal, he sees that they've chopped all the trees down uh, on Primrose Hill. Uh, they want the crest of it for anti-aircraft and searchlights probe the heavens for Basilee with narrow wands of blue. 
there's a, the kind of lyricism that you get in McNeese in something like Autumn Journal is, is, a, is a very sophisticated kind that it's unobtrusive and yet very effective often. He, he doesn't startle you in the way that Auden can startle you. But there is something juste, to use a French term, about many of his metaphors. They seem to kind of carry the right kind of appropriate charge and to dignify the everyday without um, showing off too much, which is why I don't like the self-absorbed tag, because McNeese, I don't think, is showing off particularly. There's a genuine historical urgency to the poem, which is, I think, is what drives it and gives it the tension and the vitality and the reach that it that, that it has. And although it's tangled up in his own life, there's a kind of honesty in that as well, that he's not pretending that he's a, an objective obje- observer, that he is subjectively experiencing these things and putting them down for posterity as they occur to him, but with a, you know, a lyric grace, which is extraordinary in some ways. I, I do think the poem stands up really well. And, and, and it's attractive, isn't it, partly because of, of the way in which McNeese often doubts his own motives for doing things, which is another aspect of the honesty that you were talking about. When um, he goes to Oxford to campaign for the, the anti-Lord uh, Hailsham candidate in the by-election, he stops and asks himself, what am I doing it for? and answers mainly for fun, partly for a half-believed-in principle, a core of fact in a pulp of verbiage. I mean, it's an extraordinarily unheroic, you know, um, not principled, really, but half-believed-in principle that's that's motivating him to act in this way. You couldn't think of a rhetorical act that's that's different than saying, I am for Spain, yeah. or or something like that. Yes, um, and he, he, he did always cast a cold eye on, on those who were caught up in, in kind of utopian politics, but he does go back to Spain, doesn't he, just before, uh, during the war, and he has a trip to Barcelona, which is recorded towards the end of the poem. And it, it's he was always in two minds about things, wasn't he? He almost, he didn't fight in Spain, but he goes there. He almost goes settles in America, as Auden um, and Isherwood had done. He goes there in, it's in 1941. Uh, 1940, I 1940, think, 1940, yeah. um, and stays mm. there 10 months and almost dies there, doesn't he, of um, mm. peritonitis. But in the end, while he could have stayed and, and kind of got in on the university bandwagon, which Auden was about to get onto, he comes back to do his bit in war-torn Britain. And that involves taking a job at the BBC and working in mediums that were kind of made him write what could be construed as propaganda almost, you know, that he was doing his bit for the BBC and the, the country. Working alongside Empson and the Liars' School, as they cheerfully, <laughs> as they cheerfully called it. And he does do a whole range of programmes of one kind or another. Some, as you say, about, you know, the United States Army and other morale-boosting topics like that. But he also starts writing radio plays, which I guess is a fairly new genre for obvious yes. reasons. He writes one about Christopher Columbus, doesn't he, which is yeah. which is quite popular in its day, and, and a, one towards the end of the war called The Dark Tower. And these are obviously taken seriously enough by himself as well as by his publisher t- to a- appear as books with the Faber the Faber imprint. I mean, they must, I suppose, be amongst the first radio plays ever printed in a poetry list. It was a new genre, wasn't it, the radio play? And he, he was in on the kind of ground floor. They kind of tie in a bit with that attempt to reach a popular audience that Eliot's plays exemplify and Auden's mm. plays. Um, he had had plays put on by... Um, the group, hadn't he, before as well? Yes, there's a translation of um, Agamemnon, isn't there, that they direct? It's, it was through the theatre that he met his uh, second wife, didn't he, Hedley Anderson, who was a kind of crucial figure for him as well as for um, Auden wrote, she was a singer, and Auden wrote poems for her. And she was crucial for McNeese's survival for the next 20 years. I think we, we should, probably should mention that um, the drunkenness of things being various wasn't entirely a metaphor for McNeese <laughs> from the 40s onwards, that he was often uh, drunk. Uh, and there are lots of um, anecdotes about, about working with him at the BBC by such as um, Anthony Thwaite and co. And he used to hang out in the pubs with Dylan Thomas, who, whom he was a great admirer, though it seems Thomas didn't return the compliment. Um, but his alcoholism, while not as extreme as that of some, such as John Berryman or Elizabeth Bishop, it certainly features, I think, in the perhaps in the dip in quality of his output for the sort of 
late 40s, the 50s. And what is it so extraordinary to me about McNeese's later career is, is the incredible return to form. In fact, not to, to form, to a, a whole new kind of poetic idiom uh, in his last few books, particularly in The Burning Perch, which was his last book, which is contains some of his, many of his very best poems and some of the most influential and powerful poems of the century. And I don't think you would have predicted that if you were reading Autumn Sequel, which, alas, uh, is nowhere near as interesting or good as Autumn Journal. And he was becalmed. He did a lot of travelling in this time. He was writing these BBC plays. He was propping up the bar in some Fitzrovia pub quite often. And there was a kind of directionlessness or uh, he himself felt he was suffering a sort of, uh, in some ways, had betrayed himself uh, by working doing a nine to five job, though clearly the features department were very far from nine to five. It's extraordinary. Anyone working in radio or TV since will be amazed at the um, the amount of free time they had. But he did write a lot of plays, but uh, Marilyn Butler is rather rude about them in the piece in the LRB. And I, I, mean, I quite enjoy The Dark Tower. I, that seems to me the best of them. But they don't stack up when one looks at them in comparison with, with a late volume such as The Burning Perch. Yes, so he finally, um, after 20 years, leaves the BBC in 1961. In his biography, John Stallworthy recounts the story of his final interview with the BBC bureaucrat who's been brought in to audit the department in which McNeese is working. Uh, this story, apparently, according to Stallworthy, became a BBC legend because the bureaucrat says to McNeese that he's looked at his output for the last six months and McNeese seems to have produced one short programme. And what have you been doing the rest of the time? And McNeese says, thinking. <laughs> um, anyway, that was a sign that it was time for him to go. So he goes freelance at the BBC in 1961. And whether it's coincidence or, or whether it's a result of being able to direct all his attentions back onto poetry again, uh, he does have this extraordinary late flourishing, doesn't he? Which also coincides with his last great love the, the marriage with Headley breaks up and uh, he meets a woman called Mary Wimbush who's been acting in the BBC company. So lots of things are going on in that way. But with, imaginatively, certainly different things are happening, uh, aren't they, in these in these later poems? There's an increasing interest, isn't there, in, in what you mentioned earlier on as, a, as an aspect of the earlier poems, but an increasing interest in these later poems in parable and the idea of parabolic narratives that, like all good parables, are actually rather mysterious and, and difficult to crack. Yes, parable and repetition. And, and in these poems, you really get the full McNeese delirium or the sense in which he's in some emotion is driving the poems rather than him being in control of them. And that's often the kind of theme of the poems. Um, one of the brilliant ones is called Soap Suds, which um, exemplifies this use of repetition, which I think is one of his great innovations um, in these late poems. And he's washing his hands and the soap, well, I'll, I'll read it. Soap suds. This brand of soap has the same smell as once in the big house he visited when he was eight, the walls of the bathroom open to reveal a lawn where a great yellow ball rolls back through a hoop to rest at the head of a mallet held in the hands of a child. And these were the joys of that house, a tower with a telescope, two great faded globes, one of the earth, one of the stars, a stuffed black dog in the hall, a walled garden with bees, a rabbit warren, a rockery, a vine under glass, the sea, to which he has now returned. The day, of course, is fine, and a grown-up voice cries, play, the mallet slowly swings, then crack, a great gong booms from the dog-dark hall, and the ball skims forward through the hoop, and then through the next, and then through hoops where no hoops were, and each dissolves in turn, and the grass has grown head high, and an angry voice cries, play, but the ball is lost, and the mallet slipped long since from the hands under the running tap that are not the hands of a child. I mean, there's a real Alice in Wonderland aspect to that poem, isn't there, of the... Um, and you can see the rectory and, and that he grew up in modelled in it and this kind of dissolving return to it. And a lot of these poems are about what, what Ian Hamilton once put, put in, a, in a preface to a volume, somehow getting to be 50. <laughs> and these poems are looking back <laughs> yes. on the past and saying, how did I get here? And returning to, to a, a past moment and marvelling at the difference between then and now 
uh, and the imagery sort of returns on itself as in a nightmare or, or some kind of distorting dream effect. And the croquet, which obviously is, is to some extent derives from, from Alice in Wonderland, becomes... Yes. Uh, but, but the big house, you know, it's, it's, we're obviously in Ireland, aren't we, <laughs> in the big house with its, I think, dog dark hall is a, just a brilliant formulation and the kind of thing that, that only McNeese could do. It has a kind of dream logic to it, doesn't it? And part of the dream quality of it is is the oddly intense visual power of certain things that it mentions. And I think it's Hugo Williams who said of the poem that, that the greatest touch in it is the fact that the ball is yellow. Um, there's something absolutely vividly intense about the yellowness of the ball, like, like something which is so unshakably lodged in your memory from, from childhood that, that you can't shake it out. And, and, and the great gong, which is obviously the gong for, for lunch or dinner, but also reminds you of yes. the gongs in, in kind of Yeats's Byzantium, uh, Byzantium and, and so yes. on. So yes, the ways in true. which those kind of literary illusions kind of get buried into the this tremendous onward pulse of the poem. The, the thrust of all these poems is kind of irresistible. And many of them have these, this kind of returning, quest-like, but also returning quality to some moment. I mean, this one, in, in essence, is a, a Proustian moment, isn't it? It's like the Madeleine. It returns him to this moment in childhood. But it's delivered with incredible idiosyncrasy and vividness. Which others of the, of the Burning Perch ones are you kind of drawn to? Well, I thought we, we might have to say a word about the taxis, which has always struck me as, again, a poem that only McNeese could have written. He's very interested in transport, isn't he? He's very interested in buses and trains and <laughs> taxis and cars and that sort of thing throughout his writing life. I mean, lots of people are interested in trains in the 30s because they seem to be a symbol of modernity, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. But by this stage, 1960s, I mean, taxis are fairly humdrum. They don't seem to have any kind of particular kind of e epical resonance. But McNeese in this poem turns taxis into sort of agents of hell, doesn't he? <laughs> yes, and buses as well in, in Caron, which is another brilliant mm. poem from this. And the taxis is, is really fantastic if you are of, of a certain age uh, and you are thinking, how did I get here? Because it's it, it's a brilliant parable about growing old. And de death is haunts McNeese from, from autobiography onwards or, or from his very earliest times and he's finding parables which somehow compress a life and its inevitable end in a way which is kind of hilarious as well as terrifying. And the taxi is, is um, its use of trelaw, you know, connecting to, again, sort of the nursery is again a kind of, kind of thing you might find in a Sylvia Plath poem. In the first taxi he was alone, trelaw, no extras on the clock. He tipped ninepence, but the cabbie while he thanked him, looked askance, as though to suggest someone had bummed a ride. In the second taxi, he was alone, tra but the clock showed sixpence extra. He tipped a cording, and the cabbie from out his muffler said, make sure you have left nothing behind, tra between you. In the third taxi, he was alone, tra but the tip-up seats were down, and there was an extra charge of one and sixpence, and an odd scent that reminded him of a trip to Cannes. As for the fourth taxi, he was alone, tra when he hailed it. But the cabbie looked through him and said, I can't tra well take so many people, not to speak of the dog. <laughs> That's the dog again. I think it's terrific the way that tra as this sort of token of lyricism or token of oral poetry or something gets converted in that last verse into a euphemism for bloody <laughs> or yes. some other kind of swear word it's such a wonderful kind of gesture on McNeese's part a kind of attitude towards poetry kind of summed up in that tiny little kind of lexical joke and it's just taking the the, the metaphor of kind of you know you say somebody somebody's got baggage somebody's got emotional baggage with them as they get to a certain age uh, and this is the emotional baggage but also the, the specificity of that odd scent that reminded him of a trip to Cannes. Again, that's the lipstick, that's the lipstick cigarette butts, which Larkin referred to, that sort of sentimentality about a doomed love affair, which yet um, lingers in the mind. And, it, and um, that the, the poems in, in The Burning Perch have an extraordinary compression, although their language is not difficult. They don't seem kind of obscure in any way, but they compress into these kind of microcosmic spaces a whole life and do it with a kind of jauntiness. I mean, yes. McNeese didn't know he was going to die. He died of pneumonia caught going down a cave. 
uh, and then not dress, not getting dressed from his wet clothes, going straight to the pub. And that that's what did for him. And he died when he's only 55, which was um, a, a great shame. But these poems do seem death haunted, don't they? They do. Uh, they, and they also they also seem um, wonderfully kind of inconsequential. In, uh, so in a way, some of the qualities of the earlier Montanese that we've been talking about have persisted through to this, but have been turned into a into a, this new, as you say, rather jaunty, sort of comical, tragical manner. So, I mean, for example, one of the things about the taxi is that's so striking is that he is emphatically alone. He's alone in every stanza. And and the kinds of narrative pattern that you expect from a, a story that begins in the first taxi, in the second taxi, but in the third taxi, <laughs> but you never get a but. You just get more and. It's just one taxi after another taxi after another taxi, and you're not actually obviously progressing anywhere. It is replaying childhood childhood stories as well. I think that the link to the childhood is sort of it's come full circle, and he's able to tap into all those memories and and. Yes, and the, the book ends with one called Coda, which does look like an ending. And again, it uses repetition as a way of sort of um, configuring the past. Uh, it uses the line, maybe we knew each other better in a different position, and each of it's very short. Yes. It's three line, three stanzas. Uh, and that is a yes. kind of patterning, which is what makes these poems work, I think. It's a lovely poem, isn't it, Coda? I think we should end with Coda, but it's a lovely poem um, about that same loneliness, that same isolation. Uh, but also it's it's written through with a, with a beautiful kind of tenderness of address, isn't it? So, I mean, loneliness in McNeese very rarely turns into misanthropy, which I think is one of the greatest things um, about his verse. Do you want to end by by reading Coda? Yes. Maybe we knew each other better when the night was young and unrepeated and the moon stood still over Jericho. So much for the past. In the present, there are moments caught between heartbeats when maybe we know each other better. But what is that clinking in the darkness? Maybe we shall know each other better when the tunnels meet beneath the mountain. This episode is from series two of Modern-ish Poets with Mark Ford and Seamus Perry. To listen to their first series and all other close reading series from the London Review of Books, sign up to our close reading subscription. Go to lrb.me forward slash close readings or click on the link in the description.